Hello, welcome everyone to tonight's event. Um, that song was by Lauren Hill, in case anyone was wondering. Um, yeah, so we're excited to have you all join us to have a candid discussion with the Social Justice and Health Disparities Group. Um, I will be giving it over to them after some basic Zoom norms. Um, if you are not speaking, just be kind and mute yourself. And um, as well as receiving questions to the very end. So if you have any questions during the presentation, please put them in the chat. Um, so yeah, and with that, I'll hand it over to Bakura. Hi everyone, thank you all for joining. Happy New Year. We are looking forward to pressing on. It is General Assembly time and I am overwhelmed. I don't know about you all every year um, when it's time to go in for General Assembly and start pushing our great policy initiatives. <laughs> um, we all start to get the jitters, but um, we have some great policy that we're pushing um, with the Green New Deal. We had some, some wonderful people collaborating over the past two years to make sure that we have a more equitable Virginia, a more clean Virginia, um, one where, that is centered with environmental justice um, in mind. And I'm just wanting to bring everybody on this ride with us. Um, because we need everybody involved in environmental justice work. This is not just something that is reserved for um, environmental justice groups. This is something that we should be doing day to day with our children, um, our grandchildren. It should be like second nature for us to take care of the only planet that we have. And we wanna make sure that we are spreading that message throughout so that we can have a, um, a healthy planet and a healthy life. And I am excited that I have some of my work group um, family here with me today. And I am going to turn it over to the illustrious Edwan, who will be facilitating this today. Um, although he is the facilitator, he is also a member of our work group. Edwan, if you could unmute yourself, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you all for joining. Well, thank you for that fabulous introduction, Madam President. Um, I, I want to begin, of course, by saying thank you to everyone who is here. I appreciate you guys taking time to be in this very important work group conversation. Um, I do see a legislator in here, Delegate Betsy Carr of the 69th District. I appreciate you for taking time to listen to your constituents. Um, regardless of whether they're in the 69th District or not, we need to have more representatives like you in this place. Um, I want to start with intros because we do have some illustrious folks in the Social Justice and Health Disparities Work Group. Um, and with that, I will turn it back over uh, to Ms. Bakira Parnasaya. <laughs> Hey again, folks, I'm Bakira Shabazz and I am the Social Justice and Health Disparities Work Group Team Lead. Um, I have been doing, um, I call, what you all would think is, is grassroots, I call it dirt roots advocacy for over um, two decades in the state of Virginia and across state lines, I'm dealing with environmental justice, uh, criminal injustice, um, housing disparities, prison justice work, Wherever there's a need, I've, I've been involved in, in, in that sector of work. And um, I am honored to be in this line of work because um, I have children that are greatly impacted by environmental justice harms. My oldest son is um, disabled uh, with chronic severe asthma. Uh, I have another, my oldest daughter has um, chronic severe bronchitis, another one that has exercise induced asthma, and another with the autoimmune disease that um, is affected by extreme weather patterns. And so um, coming from Newport News, Virginia, uh, living in downtown Newport News where nobody thought to tell the community what we were being exposed to and how to protect ourselves, I feel um, a sense of moral obligation to make sure that I am protecting those that um, either don't know what's going on or, or don't know how to effectively advocate um, through policy um, in reference to environmental uh, work and, and other um, harms. Um, 
being part of the Environmental Justice Collaborative, uh, we have adopted a very different definition of environmental justice. Um, and, and that definition says that anything that happens in one's environment is an environmental problem. So it's not just reserved to air, land, and water. It could be um, social justice, criminal justice, education, mental health, all of those things are, I like to think of environmental work as a, as a wheel and environmental is, is right in the center. And all of those other things are spokes coming out of it. Environmental justice is first. That is, that is the premise of life is the environmental work and everything else comes out of it. So if there's an imbalance in the core, then of course it's gonna be an imbalance in the spokes. And so um, with that being said, again, thank you for joining us. And I'd like to um, turn it over to my dear friend, Pody. Right, thank no, you. No, I'm gonna take it back from you, Pody. I'm gonna take All it right. back from you because you got a little bit of longer spiel. I'm gonna turn it over to my great, great friend who I've known for many, many years, um, Charles Brown. Hey y'all, um, my name is Charles Brown. I am a member of the Social Justice and Health Disparities Work Group. Um, have been on since the inception. Many of you were all at the, um, the major conference that we had almost two years ago now up in Richmond and I'm glad to be here. And I'll speak more about myself uh, further on in the program, but I know Cody has a lot to say. So I'll keep it short for now and I'll pass over to Cody. All right, where you, well, you are all entirely too kind. It is a great honor and a privilege to be among such amazing people. My name is Pody, and my I am an economist. I call myself a community economist and statistician. And I was involved uh, early on, about 20 years ago, in getting a certain project started that is now known as modern monetary theory which uh, is the economics underlying the Green New Deal, AOC's Green New Deal, what uh, Bernie Sanders realized in his 2020 platform. Now, the reason that folks were kind enough to make a little extra room for me is because some of you may not know what MMT is. So I'll do a brief overview so you see where I'm coming from. MMT takes on, for many people who are starting to hear about it, this problem, this lie that you see on the screen right now, <laughs> Uh, from Lady Thatcher, which is completely false. It usually comes up in the context of how do we pay for things. Uh, now, uh, the way we pay for things pushes us to understand something about how modern money works. And that's where I would like to start this. So modern money is based on a simple idea that if you can, if you have state power, you can impose and forgive liabilities. And when you can do that, the permissions to cancel those liabilities circulate as your nation's currency. Now, this not only answers Lady Thatcher's question of how do you pay for things, which is what people usually focus on, it also changes our worldview. It changes our perspective of what is natural, what is necessary, versus what is a matter of policy choice. And that's going to change how we look at people. Now, this uh, notion that you can uh, create a currency and circulate it that way has been known for a very long time, at least, least 5,000 years worth of recorded history. Look at David Graeber's debt, the unfortunately late David Graeber debt, the first 5,000 years, if you'd like to see the details. But right here on the soil uh, that we're sitting on, uh, in my case, uh, Monacan land, uh, there was a group of violent people who for a time projected uh, ability to impose taxes on this soil and they knew how to uh, issue a currency and on theirs they were very direct about how it worked, receivable and payment of taxes. Fortunately, we had another person here in our country who also knew how to do this and he, defeated them and their currency went, uh, became worthless. Now, through this 5,000 year history, there was a brief period centered around the 19th century uh, when governments around the world got together and pretended that, uh, that money was the tokens that it is stamped into. 
especially the malleable gold tokens. And they promised not only to receive it in payment of taxes, but they made another promise, a promise to also convert it into a certain amount of gold. But at will, we've gone on and off it. And you see the, uh, the, the traitorous Confederates ran a currency without gold and Abraham Lincoln also suspended conversion to gold when he needed to get the job done. Now, having defeated the Confederates, uh, the defeated planter class was none too happy about the changes in the social relations that uh, recognized as human beings, an entire class, an entire race of people. And uh, they pined to get that control back again and decenter people. For a brief time when we almost had democracy here in Virginia, you could see them talking about things like debt, talking about things like the taxpayer and the taxpayer's dollars, which they put up against uh, classes that they considered worthless. And they uh, were essentially putting the rights of property against the rights of people. This was a dreadful, uh, dreadful tradition that went back to the times of slavery that were in living memory for them at that time. And they made it very clear that that's what their rhetoric of austerity was all about. Now, that rhetoric continued going forward with people who, after the New Deal, uh, when FDR again suspended conversion to gold so he could get a very important job done, yes, getting us out of the Great Depression, but then also defeating fascism. And in the process of defeating fascism, he extended the recognition of people and the recognition of the rights of workers in the New Deal. As soon as that war was over, those forces that pined for the days of coerced labor got to work again. So here's a quote from Reed Larson, Matt, evil mastermind, if there is such a thing as an evil person of the National Right to Work Committee, putting all the pieces together. So you see here values that we might work for as progressives that he connects to a, fe a federal balanced budget. Running a balanced budget is effectively like tying yourself to a cross of gold. It is Lady Thatcher telling you, you may not use your hands to control a pen that writes a number arbitrarily big to shape society with your own hands. Leave that to people who have property. And Reed Larson is absolutely continuity to that. We've had a major victory on this front, pushing back against these myths about debts and deficits, which modern monetary theory came onto the field about 25 years ago to demolish and to put, uh, to put the power back in the hands of the people with AOC. AOC, who also brought us the Green New Deal, scored a major victory on New Year's where she put a hole, a massive hole in what we call pay go, which is a rule that says you have to pretend that you are not the currency issuer at the federal level. And you have to pretend that you have to either find taxes or cut items in order to pay for things. Well, she carved out, as you can see on the screen, a hole big enough to drive Medicare for all and the entire Green New Deal through. And this gives you a hint as to, as to what the Green New Deal is. With that, I will, uh, I will pause and let us go to the next thing. Thank you so much for allowing me to do the introduction of what my academic background is and why I'm sitting here talking about the Green New Deal. Back to you, Edwin. Perfect, thank you, Cody, for that. Um, and I'll, I'll take a brief second to, to, to introduce myself to everyone. Hi, y'all, I'm Edwin Whitehead. I am not only the facilitator, but I am a um, avid and very dedicated member of this work group. Um, it has been the highlight of my life, um, serving with the folks that you see before you, trying to think and create and surround policy to do what it's supposed to do in, in the essence of governance, which is better the quality of people's lives, no matter how we do it. Um, I do want to kick it back to you, Pody. Um, with, with our first question of the evening, which is, um, what is, to you, what is the, the essence, the, the 
golden meaning of, of what a Green New Deal um, looks like, whether it be in Virginia or statewide, or what roles that we play within that. Thank you so much. Well, once AOC saw the light with regard to modern money theory, which happened in approximately April of the year when she was running for Congress, she also came to understand how to uh, use that currency in a way uh, that included price stability so that she could take on bigger projects. So key to, for especially for progressives, key to technically maintaining price stability, because if you just purchase things, once you realize you, have, you are not budget limited at the federal level, you're only limited by our know-how and capabilities, if you start spending into that, you could potentially run into limits and run into inflationary problems. So in order to take on the ambitious projects that our federal government could take on, like defeating fascism, like defeating the Confederacy, uh, you need to pay a little bit of attention to price stability. So for progressives, a key mechanism for doing that is a federally funded, locally administered job guarantee that starts with people where they are, as they are. At the moment, we use unemployment under the guise of controlling price stability. Now, unemployment is a cruel technique. It's a technique that uh, harkens back to the, those days of coerced labor. And it's not that terribly effective uh, at any technical uh, ends either. Replacing that with a job guarantee does provide the price stability you need without the scourge of unemployment with in fact the ability to provide a just transition and rejuvenation of our communities. So AOC was aware of this and she ran on a job guarantee, which would allow her to essentially put grease in the wheels of the massive engine of the US economy. And what could, use could she put that to? Well, her thought was how about save the planet, which was facing a global climate crisis. So indeed that's what she ran on. And when she got to office, there was a group of young folks, the, the uh, Sunrise Movement, and they were saying Green New Deal. And she said, yeah, that's what I'll call it. So uh, in fact, MMT and a federally funded locally administered job guarantee that starts with people where they are as they are is the core of the Green New Deal. And it takes on the global climate crisis, not global warming. Global warming has to do with greenhouse gases. That centers the wrong thing. Crisis centers people. And for many people, the crisis of our extracted economy is already here. When the job guarantee addresses that, brings people back into the fold, remits communities so they get local political power. And from the local political power, they can move to ask federal questions that eventually address the uh, crisis and problems of greenhouse gases as well. So it's MMT and job guarantee, that's the core and that's the essence of the actual Green New Deal. Awesome, thank you, Patty, I appreciate that. Um, I just, to, this, I'm gonna open up this next question to, um, to everyone in the, the, in the work group. Um, and I, of course, I'll, I'll kick it to you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, how, did we, how did we all get involved in the uh, Green New Deal? Is where I wanna kind of just the essence of where it all began. So I'll start with you, Bakira. You said, how did I get involved with the Green New Deal? Yes, ma'am. Um, I got involved, um, and this is a funny story, you all. When I first heard about the Green New Deal, the language was that the Green New Deal would eradicate poverty. And I was so mad about that statement that I was like, oh my goodness, I got to get involved with this. And let me find out who's running this because that is so egregious and I have to change that language. We got to take that out because poverty is not just about jobs, you know, and also jobs can also cause poverty. And so I wanted there to be a clear understanding of, of what poverty is, how it works and what contributes to that. And, and I didn't want people to think that just the presence of a, a job would, would fix those things. And so I, I, I talked to Lee and Karen and I was like, we got to change that language. And um, they were like, okay. And I was, and then I, I, I kept like nagging and nagging and nagging. And I was like, 
if you all don't change that language, I'm going to build coalition against the Green New Deal and we're going to take that language down. And so then it was put to it, but we had a conversation about it and everybody agreed. And I kind of just stuck with it from there. And, um, you know, it was a learning process. And all of this, folks, listen, we're not going to always get everything right. You know what I'm saying? We, we, have to, we have to understand that we are just simple human beings, okay? It's, it's nothing perfect about us and it's okay to make mistakes. We just got to fix them when we make them, okay? <laughs> that's, that's basically it. And so, you know, we have our, our working groups and, you know, it was things we didn't like and things we did like and, and we came to a compromise and that is what governance is all about, coming to that compromise that, it, it, that we are at a place where everybody is okay. And um, although you know, what it looks like now with our two-party system is that that is not a reality. It really is a reality. And that is what bipartisanism looks like. And that is what we're hoping to, to push for um, this year is, is just greater leverage with all of our legislators being involved and saying, listen, we're going to put our, our gripes aside and we're going to put people first. And, and that is what I wanted to make sure um, was centered with the Green New Deal was people. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I will pass it over to Charles for the question. Hey, everyone. So um, talking about the Green New Day, I kind of want to talk about my journey with environmental activism in general and how I got started. And for me, it was in college. So I went to Tennessee State University at HBCU in Nashville. And, um, you know, those of you down the college, you know, a bunch of clubs and organizations. And I ran into one called Gateway to Heritage. And they were the first ones who got me hip to environmental activism and not just in the sense of say the polar bear, say the whales and um, clean air and whatnot, but actually looking at it from a human standpoint. And um, there was a case that I, that I ended up working on with my major, because I was a political science and geography major. So there was a case in Dixon, Tennessee, where um, yeah, the whole community whose land was literally being polluted, their land and their water was being polluted by a landfill that was um, near their homes, near their neighborhood. And on the white side of town, they no one, they were warned by the local officials, hey, don't use this water, don't clean with it, um, don't do anything with it because it'll make you sick. And they, on the black side of town, they pretty much let whole families use this water for decades and to this day they still have like cancer and everything rampant through their community and um when i found out about this case that really like just drove me down the rabbit hole and started attending conferences being more involved in the work and the one thing i noticed is that whenever i would go to conferences and go different places you know within the environmental movement i would be one of maybe myself and maybe two other people of color black folks there and everyone else would be Caucasian. So I just noticed I was always the one black person in a sea of white folks who've been in the movement for years and years. And I noticed that a lot of conversations never really re revolved around us. We weren't really included. The plights of poor people weren't really included. These conversations were always, in my mind, superficial, just dealing with, again, inanimate objects. And not to say that whales and polar bears and um, uh, living creatures don't matter, but it's like, what about our communities and people and the projects and people who can't pay rent? Like, if you're trying to tell someone who can't pay rent, okay, you need to care about um, folks or animals thousands of miles away, it doesn't connect. So um, fast forward, you know, I moved to, uh, moved to Virginia about 10 years ago now and, and um, got involved in activism out here, but more recently I got involved with the um, Atlantic Coast Pipeline and the uh, Mountain Valley Pipelines, which had been proposed a few years ago, and there had been a big fight around that. I'm pretty sure many of you on this call remember that. And fortunately, um, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline has been killed, and we're working on killing the MVP. But all that led up to um, 2019. Uh, people have been fighting the pipeline for years. Of course, we had Trump getting in there uh, in the interim within in 2017, and there had been a big push. People have been talking for years, you know, we need something that can um, put us on the right track because we know that 
um, fears that climate change is killing us. Uh, um, at this point, they're saying that humanity has up until 2030 before we reach the point of no return. So when they finally announced, hey, we're gonna do this um, Green New Deal, and when AOC had announced it, and a bunch of buzz came around, I was like, okay, this is what we need. And it was just a matter of time for me. I'm like, okay, this is what we need. And I was in immediately. And um, I actually, you know, but Kara's not telling the whole story. I kind of dragged her into the environmental space because I remember when oh, we yeah. first met she, she <laughs> was not um, with it because her mindset wasn't, I'm pretty sure she can tell you more so like, like, why do we care about the environment when we got people getting arrested and, and um, folks can't pay, you know, to eat and we got folks being abused in prisons. And it's funny that she ended up being become, become the leader. But I was like, you know, we need folks who are going to who really understand the struggles from a firsthand uh, point of view. So for me, it was just natural. I felt like, you know, our voices aren't usually heard. And just to see that we have a whole working group where for this call right now, you know, three out of four panelists are people of color, you know, two black men and a black woman. That's powerful. That's something that when I first got involved, you would have never seen or rarely seen when I would go to conferences. So to me, I just, um, that kind of answers why I got involved with the environmental movement, but as well as this. So I didn't want to take up too much time, but that's it for me. And um, I guess, am I passing it back to you, Edwin, or to Pody? Oh, we can kick it over to Pody, and then I'll go last to answer this, and we'll move on. OK. So I got involved with the Green New Deal because I've been working on the economic underpinnings for 20 years. And we had that major breakthrough. People who had worked very closely with AOC came to Virginia, and we were organizing across Virginia. Uh, we had a tour early on, right after the, uh, the uh, election, to bring the Green New Deal to people in Virginia. Now, at the same time, there was this other group using this brand, Green New Deal Virginia, and I was trying to figure out how to get a, get a hold of them. And eventually, with Josh, help of uh, advice of Joshua Cole, I found my way to, to get Sam's here, and then that got me to this group. And at the time, they were saying, nobody knows what the Green New Deal is. And that was honest and true for, in part, except for the nobody. And I tried to say, hey, no, some people do know what it is. So I tried to engage and engage in, engage in good faith and try to share with them what was going on. Uh, and that put me at that first conference where I went around to all the people, all the coalition that had been put together, uh, spreading the word what the Green New Deal actually is. And the place where it resonated and stuck and the place where the leadership emerged was exactly with this group, was with Bakura. And I see we got Queen on here as well on the, on the, uh, in the audience and Edwan, uh, because that really is the core of the Green New Deal. And so that's, uh, that's how I got involved initially. And that is how I stayed in this working group and followed. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, I am, I mean, for me, I, I got involved in this work um, because of, of Bakir Shabazz um, and her kind of bringing me into the work and giving me a, a different vision of, of what environmental justice actually looks like. Um, it was something that I had only heard very briefly, kind of, I was kind of on the Al Gore tip around environmental justice, and that was kind of all the information that I had, and, and Bakir definitely opened, opened that world up to me, you know, completely and holistic, holistically um, but I, I'm thankful for that. I'll keep it short and sweet so we can keep rolling. Um, and I want to kick it back to you, uh, Bakira. What, what, well, actually, I'm going to leave this one to Pody. I'll start with you, Pody, and then we'll end with Bakira on this one. Um, what made us choose the social justice work group? What made us choose the? The social justice work group. The social no, justice. We already answered that one um, at, at one. Go to the next one, please. Okay, no problem. Um, so the other part of that was um, what makes this, this work group so incredibly important to this work? Yes. So Bakura and Charles, putting those two pieces together, they get to the heart of why this is so important. Uh, job guarantee that I mentioned before is not a jobs program. 
and to treat it as a jobs program is exactly making the mistake that Bukura pointed out. It is a shift in worldview. And when you shift that worldview, it centers people. And things that we normally ascribe to personal responsibility, uh, suddenly we see our policy choices. And when we see that, that has implications not only at the federal level, which is the only place the Green New Deal can actually happen, it also has implications for the local level. And what we can do at the state level is we can remove barriers. The, the state level the lo and the municipal level is where a new deal would actually be implemented. And that's where you will run into the structural inequities that will prevent it from being implemented in a way that benefits all people. We saw that in the original new deal and we do not want to make those same mistakes. So if there were to be a flagship bill, let's say, it would, its flag would be planted firmly in the social justice and health disparities working group at the state level, dismantling the, uh, the laws, dismantling the rules, prisons, jails, ordinances, those are all under the control of the state. And that is where we can work to remove barriers and also to mobilize people, mobilize people and spread the word about what is available at the federal level so that we can win and we can re-empower our votes. There's an element of voter rights and undoing voter suppression in informing people of the power of their vote for the federal level at the same time that we remove the barriers at the local level. So this group, this working group is really, as before I said, the hub. Um, I want to kick it to, to you, Bakura. Um, that we, we, when we talked about this, which we do a lot, um, there's a, you always are very big about people working in silos. Um, and that, that was something I really, for me, that, that stands very firm in my mind and would love for you to, to touch base and kind of define what that looks like um, for other folks that could possibly be in other working groups. Um, so working in silos, it, it, let me, I, let me explain how that works. So you say you are, you have an issue and you go to the, um, supervisor and they're like, oh, well, I don't know about that. That's handled by this department. Um, and then you go to that next department and they're like, oh, that's for the, the higher ups, but all of these people work on the same issue. Right. So you would think that everybody should know how to rectify a simple problem. But everybody don't know how to rectify a simple problem because everybody is doing something different on the same thing. And nobody else knows what anybody else is doing. And so collectively, that body is not truly functioning as it should. If you think of the human body, everything must work in concert. Everything knows what the other thing is supposed to be doing and how everything needs to work in order to be a healthy, thriving body. And so working in silos um, is, is what that is. It's like, oh, we're just going to do this and not know about the other thing. And so you don't understand the implications of other things on the thing that you're working with. And so we have to have a 360 degree approach to um, fixing things or what you suggest, especially with policy, may not be the right thing to suggest because you haven't weighed in on, on a lot of variables that you may not have known about. We see that a lot in the African-American communities, people making suggestions that they think is right for the African-American community without going into the community and, and asking it like, oh, if we bring these jobs here, um, this will be great. Um, not understanding that these people are, are not skilled. Um, they won't qualify for the jobs. And so what does that do to the, the people? That lowers the morale of the people, that they can't get the jobs of the, of the, uh, uh, the, the new, um, let's say Amazon that you brought to their area. Um, and so it's important that we are opening up our minds to receive additional information so that we can make the best possible policy recommendations that there is where everybody can benefit. You know, this our social justice and health disparities work group um, is the heartbeat of the people. We, we are centered 
on what people need to be okay. Thank you for that. Um, I do want us to, to roll through here. Um, there were, we did have a, we've been together for two years. Um, and in that time, we have definitely come up with a whole lot of ideas for policy. Um, and I mean, just to, to touch base it, for any for any of us in the working group here that want to just kind of touch on um, what were some of our policy initiatives uh, that we've been talking about. You want to roll those policies out? Sure. Um, the the first one is the um, job guarantee, um, of course, which, like Cody said, can only be done at federal level, and kind of working through what the state would do to to stop hindering people from being able to obtain said jobs, um, raising the minimum wage um, with the mindset of inflation in the process to a living wage, um, and the bigger part of that with that we focused on was the uh, health disparities and focusing on public health, giving people an actual choice for the uh, methods that they choose to use and also acknowledging um, alternative methods to the current streamlined medicine uh, methods that we, that we do use. Was there a forever barring policy? Yes, and um, the forever barring policy was rolled into our job initiatives and I will also put that one as our- And the barrier? Work. Um, the forever barring barrier, um, just being uh, removing, not allowing um, your criminal background status to be a hindrance to anything for that matter, whether it be housing or a job or any of those things. Right. So with the with the, um, I'm gonna speak on the the forever barring, and um, the removing barrier. So the forever barring is. Um, right now in the state of Virginia and in and a, and a lot of places across the nation, once you have committed a crime and it could be something as small as still in a pack of bubble gum, if you're charged with a misdemeanor for that pack of bubble gum, you will forever be labeled a criminal for the rest of your life. Don't matter if you go on to win the Nobel Peace Prize, you're a criminal having Nobel Peace Prize winner is what you are. And that is absolutely ridiculous there is there is no chance for redemption um or anything policy wise at, at at this particular time and um when you look at that from a morality standpoint everybody wants forgiveness for something one two three four five hundred thousand times in their lifetime and so people should be able to have a second chance to be whole, sometimes a third and fourth chance to be whole, depending on the, um, the situation. And, um, you know, because of the barriers that are put in place, once you have been labeled as a criminal, there's certain licenses you can't have, um, certain places you can't go, um, even after you've done your time. And so it's like, even though you've gotten out of the physical prison, you're still in a prison in society because there's things you can't do. And we wanted to get rid of that. And so we had a policy recommendation um, that if for misdemeanors, um, after three years of not committing any more um, offenses, that, that would, it would just drop off. Um, if it was a violent crime, depending on what the violence was in seven years, it will fall off. If it was an act where it was, um, you know, a, a murder, it would have to be 10 years with the, with the governor's recommendation. Um, and there was things that you would have to do, you know, to, to make sure that you were not um, a, a risk to society. So that means maintaining a job, not getting in any more trouble, completing different certifications, you know, all of those things that regular people do anyway. Um, I don't think anybody wakes up in the morning and, and or, or growing up, somebody asks you, what do you want to be when you grow up? Nobody's answer is a criminal. And <laughs> no uh, adults, uh, um, same-minded adults want to be criminals either. And so when sometimes when people's backs is up against the wall, um, they do irrational things. And so, um, you know, we should, we should weigh out what someone has done and give them a chance 
to redeem themselves. It, it is important to us as, as in, we never talked religion, but we, we are believers that in people and that um, we wanted to give people a chance and, and we didn't want there to be any barriers and to people being able to thrive. You should be able to, um, now this is, this is um, not talking about uh, uh, predatory charges, but um, people should be able to, to live. There should be no restrictions on fishing. Like right now you can lose your, your license to drive, your license to fish, your license to carry a firearm. You won't be able to be, have a barber's license, like all of those things that you can't do. And I'm just wondering, what do we expect people to do if they can't, you know, create industry if they if they so choose. And so we wanted to, to um, definitely address that issue through policy. And um, with the job guarantee, uh, well, not necessarily, and I don't even think we, we really use that terminology. Um, we talked about training programs. And so what we have seen um, is that policies where people are coming and bringing in industry into Virginia, they're like, oh, it's gonna be a ton of jobs for everybody. And we're gonna make sure that um, marginalized people have access to these jobs. And so what that means is that um, access is, is a now hiring sign. And if you don't qualify, you're short. Um, what we wanted is training programs now to get people ready for renewable energy jobs that are coming. If we don't train unskilled people now, they will not get these jobs that are coming. And so if we're pushing the narrative that they will, we need to stop it. They won't qualify. They're gonna be up against those that are coming out of the fossil fuel industry that have a ton of experience and rightfully so. And so in order to get them ready for the job market, training has to start now. And that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to even bring training into the high school level. So those were some of the things that we talked about um, over the, the two years that we have been um, convening. Um, but, um, you know, those are, those are hard conversations. And um, maybe next year, Virginia will be ready to start having those, those hard conversations. But we saw with special session and how that went down that we, we just didn't feel that the state was ready to go forward with what we had to bring, being very intentional with what we wanted for people. Um, so we'll try in 2022 to push those legislative uh, initiatives. If I can jump in, Edwin. Yeah. Edwin, you're muted if you're talking. Um, I, I had a follow-up question for you, uh, actually, because you were saying 2022, um, were any of the, um, the Green New Deal Supportive legislators, to your knowledge, um, supportive uh, or receptive to the policy initiatives um, that we have? <clears throat> no, none of the legislators that were a part of the Green New Deal reached out to the Social Justice and Health Disparities Work Group. I don't, I don't even know if they knew that we were a thing. I know we tried to um, meet with Sam Rasul um, early on; it never happened, and so maybe um, they'll be ready. Um, the next general assembly session, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Um. Uh, yeah. This this question of uh, forever barring, I think, very well illustrates the point that I made about telling the difference between what is personal responsibility and what is a policy choice, and I, I think that one of the mistakes that was made in arguing the bill uh, this summer was uh, focusing on the uh, focusing on the charge. What we, would, we did in our discussions that Bukura was talking about is we backed up and looked at the social effects. So a slogan that I learned when I was working with my community here in Harrisonburg was stop punishing our nephews who have served their time. Mm -hmm. At one level, it makes no more sense after the sentence has been served to have additional collateral back damages. So separating those two things already is an important thing to do. And then the, the, way, the place that the numbers came from was when risk of reoffense, which is already a conservative measure, fades to background, it no longer makes sense to continue punishing people unless there's some hidden agenda 
to stigmatize entire groups. So there's the, there's the argument to make. And then you don't make distinctions based on the nature of the, on the, the, the visceral reaction to the charge. You make, you make a, a assessments on the basis of actual, uh, actual risks of reoffense. So that's, that's one thing. And then with regard to the using incarceration to begin with, uh, that is uh, that is a uh, that is a part of, as Bakura pointed out, if you're pushing people into the margins, and you do the job training without the jobs, well, even with the job, even with the job training, when we don't have the jobs, it's going to do nothing. It's going to reproduce patterns of structural inequity. So that's why we need the federal job guarantee, which accepts all comers as a right. Only the currency issuer can do that. But that means it's the currency issuer's decision that some people were left out. At the state level, we make other decisions to leave people out and marginalize them through zoning, through petty offenses. We saw in the Department of Justice Ferguson report how that was done. And I would suggest that there are in the public health side uh, bills that legislators, I didn't succeed in my share here, the bill, bills that legislators might want to consider that may seem counterintuitive that may seem like they're not very important, but I would say repealing, uh, enabling legislation for tall grass and weed violations. If you can do that, you're now touching on some fundamental attitudes that are tainting all of our policy making. Uh, environmental toxins, we have coal tar sealant, which is a known respiratory irritant. There's no reason to have it, it's only cosmetic. Can we take that on? It has uh, inequitable distribution and even my, it, was, it was introduced in 2018 by my Republican representative. But it's all rooted in a change in how we look at things and realizing, no, it's not personal responsibility where you train or punish, it's a policy choice. So you remove barriers. Okay, I do wanna keep us rolling. Um, so I, I know that we, we said we were looking forward to doing some policy initiatives for 2022. Um, is there any current legislation that is up right now that you can think of off the top of your head that, that is that you're looking forward to for this session? Well, of course, we're supporting um, the Green New Deal Act and the other bills that um, Green New Deal is um, pushing. We're also hoping to have a comprehensive expungement bill. Um, push through this year. I know Richard Walker and I were, were um, working on that um, and at least, um, you know, wanting uh, parole back in the state, um, which we've been trying to get back for 25 years. You know, Virginia has to <laughs> stop making us wait 25 and 30 years to get progressive laws passed. You know, um, you know, parole makes sense. I know that they're, they were wanting to do a study um, on parole. Parole never ended um, for the people that we had parole on in the state, so I'm not sure um, what more needed to be studied or if that was just a delay um, technique to make people wait even more time. You know, those people that are waiting on parole have waited, have served at least 25 years, um, and that was when they stopped parole in 1995, and so um, we just have to do a better job at, at centering people in Virginia and, and, and instead of corporations, which we, we seem to love to death. We allow our corporations to pollute, poison, kill at will, but people, we make sure we throw the book at people. Thank you, Bakira. Um, so I, I do wanna um, ask this question specifically of uh, that are in the work group. Um, from a diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI lens, does the uh, Virginia Green New Deal um, fit the EJ bill? Does it fit the environmental justice bill that we are looking for? Correct. That's what I was trying to say right So, you guys, in case you all didn't know, the, the social justice and health disparities work group um, it's probably one of the grittiest work groups. And we, we, these are the tough questions that we have to, you know, constantly, um, you know, ask ourselves, are we, are we, you know, centering people? Is, is this equitable? Is this right? Is this just? 
Um, and we evaluate and watch our legislators very carefully. Um, are they going to these communities? Are they engaging with all people? Um, or, or, or are they just putting forth policy? Um, and what we have seen is people are getting better. Um, I, will, I will say that. Um, were they in the communities outside of their own? No, they weren't. And so to center people, you have to make sure that you're going to the people. And we would like to see a lot more of that um, coming forward, you know, outside of election time, we would like to see our legislators, they got to remember that once they get elected, they're appointed to committees that represent the entire state. And so we want to see our legislators that may not live in our area, come down and say, hello, I care. This is what I do. How can I help? Um, you know, criminal justice is happening all over the state. And so if you're on that, on that committee, you should be showing up in the areas where um, there's high crime at and finding out what's really going on in those areas, not hearing about it and just passing judgment. And so EJ means going into the communities and talking to and building community with the people, not necessarily your community members, but all Virginians. Thank you for that, Mature. Um, so the, the bigger part of this for me, um, what do we think the Virginia Green New Deal could have done or can do currently, because we still haven't you know, finished it and figured it out all yet, um, can do better um, at all. That would, in, that would lead to a more inclusive environmental justice centered body. I think you touched on that um, a little bit in our, in our last question. Um, I don't want to think about Charles and Pody. Charles was off for a little bit. Charles, are, are you back on? Do you want to? I saw him. I on. believe so. He has some tech issues. I saw now, his name. I think something that uh, that would make things better, I think, is going back to what Bakura said about uh, about siloing and really genuinely treating this working group as a hub. We've had discussion, for example, of financing the Green New Deal. And we already pointed out at the beginning, we cannot fund things the way the federal government does. So certain things we shouldn't be talking about, infrastructure, jobs, we can't fund that. Uh, we can take out barriers. If we try to finance and it's based on a misunderstanding of how money works, then we get things like bottom-up economy, which is fundamentally austerity balanced budget error. We get things like public banking, which doesn't work, it misunderstands how money works. We get things like finance, which is just a shell game that ends up with privatization of our state infrastructure. We have to have these things clear. We didn't have a chance to talk in these ways with the other groups. Uh, we can similarly uh, look at why we should be making this group a hub, having more plenary sessions, having more coming back together and having the uh, legislators come through. Thank you, Cody. Um, and I mean, to, to me, I'll, I'll touch on this one as well. I don't jump in very often, but for this one I will. Um, center, I mean, centering, the center body of this work should definitely revolve around this work. And I say that because we are literally, and I, I mean this in a figurative and in a literal way, this, this work group is the literal heartbeat of this legislation because we deal with people. Um, at the end of the day, we can have transportation, we can address fossil fuels, we can address all of those things that are very material and you know, something I can hold in my hand and you know, I get rid of it if I need to. But making who does who does this bill work for is what this group focuses on. And I think that in, in a lot of a lot of ways we lose that essence uh, of government when we when we legislate. Um, and I, I'll kick it to my to my next question here. Um, I, I, Delegate Carr, I hope you hear me loud and clear for this one for this next one. 
Um, we hear legislators say uh, a lot of the times, if you're not in the district or if you're not in my direct district, um, you should contact your legislator uh, for an issue that is a priority. Um, why is this bad? And why do we all want to stop the tactic legislators from having this as an out? To, to have this as an excuse to not listen to Virginians that are not Virginians. Oh man, that's 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 the that's the that's the go-to when you don't live in one of your legislators' um, districts. Um, the reason why that's bad is because, like I said earlier, once you get into committee, you represent the entire state. And so to tell a, a, a Virginian that, hey, you don't live in my district, um, you might want to contact your legislator who may not be on the committee that your issue addresses, um, is kind of not good. It's, it's not good. Um, you should hear what anybody wants to bring to you. Yes, you have a loyalty to your voter base, but I think that the way that we we and pain is that uh, is wrong in itself. You know, a, a lot of people don't understand governance that yes, you're gonna vote for who you want in your district, but you're gonna vote for who you want in your district to do the best for the state, not the best for your district. They're state representatives. Your district is handled by your city council. And so if we broke that down, then, then your constituents will understand that, hey, I represent the entire state once I'm voted in, I'm your representative to do what's best for the entire state. And so when somebody outside of where you live comes to you, they understand, yes, we need to address, we need to address that. Or if something may not be happening in your community that's happening in another community, um, you could, you're the one that needs to bridge that gap. And so if we have an impoverished community um, and a non-impoverished community and the impoverished community comes to the legislator and the, and the non-impoverished community, it is that, that representative's job to take that information back to our community and say, listen, we have a part of Virginia that is struggling, that, is, that, that needs us, and we need to show up for that part of Virginia because we're all Virginians, right? Last I checked, we are. Um, and so let's talk about what we can do. Um, I talked to somebody from that community and they said, this is what they want. How do you all feel about this? How can we help this part of Virginia? Because one thing about it, if all of Virginia is 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 good and great and can and can thrive, then that is the Virginia that we want. You know, we're not going to eradicate all crime. We're not going to eradicate all poverty. We got to be realist about some things. There's some things we're not going to get rid of, but we can minimize it, and that is how we do that. And an advantage that you have at the state level, if I may add one, is uh, that a legislator who's across the, across the Commonwealth may have fewer of the uh, local entanglements with uh, local elites that might bias and prevent solution of uh, more localized problems if you step back and have a more objective view. And I'll add, hey everyone, I had got past some technical difficulties, Welcome sorry back. about that. But, um, a legislator that comes to mind since, you know, we're in the process of keeping people honest is Norman, who's in the Senate. And um, I know his district is mostly like uh, James uh, City County and Williamsburg. Yes, and yet he sits on a lot of um, like criminal justice. Uh, I know he sits on like the, um, I believe the Crimes and Justice Committee. And, yes, he sits uh, on the uh, Senate Course of Justice and um, the Senate Finance Committee. Mm -hmm. Right. But his district is not doesn't experience um, those issues on the same level as, let's say, um, some of the ones in the Hampton Roads area, particularly like around um, Norfolk, you know, Newport News and Portsmouth. But yeah, a lot of the um, the proposals that that are either killed or passed through on his committee affect those um, communities. And yet when you go to legislators like him, and the reason I brought him up is because um, he's someone that I've had some very negative interactions with, um, it's because they'll say that, you know, well, you're not in my district. And as soon as you say, well, you're um, over this piece of legislation, or this piece of legislation is in your committee right now, and 
we want to tell you why you, you should or shouldn't support it. As soon as they ask you what this should be and you say you're not in theirs, they don't even care to talk to you. So we noticed this being a big problem, you know, in years past. And um, yeah, just piggybacking off of what Karen and Holy said. Understood. So thank, thank you for that. Um, I, I do want to roll into our last question before we open up the floor to questions. Um, I, man, this and this last one is, is a big one because it's kind of this, the, the mantra I feel like that this work group carries um, in, a, in a lot of positive ways over the last couple of years. Um, we mentioned a lot of the times we actually, we just did in our last question too, around um, building a state black medical power. Um, what does this look like? Um, how can it be done? And why is it necessary in, in the plight to form a more equitable? For all I'll the reasons- first. Oh, you go ahead. For all the reasons that we just mentioned, that's why it's important. And the way that we do that is by going outside of our own districts and, and building um, community and networks outside of our districts and supporting candidates outside of our districts. Um, we, we really should just change the way that we do things here. Um, because if you have Let's say I'm in Chesterfield. So um, if we have a champion in Fairfax, a champion legislator in Fairfax that is going to push, um, let's say, raises for teachers, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to help him campaign in Fairfax. You know, even though I'm, he's not my representative, I'm going to tell people about him. I want the state to know that this person is, is a champion. And once his constituency sees that that person has supporters all over, they're more likely to support that person as well. And so now the people are having control of who is in the General Assembly. And so the people who have a, a shared interest is now have way in all over the Commonwealth because we have joined a force and said, we're, gonna, we're going to show up for people everywhere, good candidates that are running, no matter where they are in, in Virginia. And everybody will see that and we'll know who the good people are that we should be, that we should, um, be supported. And that way the power returns to its rightful owner, um, which is we the people, the most powerful, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, office, and, and governance is we the people. And um, once we can can do that, I think that we'll we'll have um, what we need to get what we need passed to make sure that Virginia is is thriving. Um, uh, uh, it's just we got to do something different. Doing the, the 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 saying is doing the same thing over and over hoping for a different result is the definition of insanity. So we got to do something different. It, it's, it's, it's time. Um, our children and our grandchildren are depending on us to do something different and to get something different. Those of us who have been in this fight for many, many years, that is not, the fight is not the legacy that I want to leave for my grandchild. It, it, it's, it, it, the buck stops here. We have put too much on these children. Children, we, we have seen a, a uprise of teenagers bearing the burden of the world. They're not at the playgrounds anymore because we failed them. It's time to give children their childhood back. They should not be having to come on the front lines to fight for what's right because adults will not get their stuff together. I can go. Um, go ahead, last you know. So this is gonna be probably taboo to many of you on the call, especially since I'm assuming most of 
you all are on the left of the spectrum, myself included, but I think we can really take a lesson from um, our counterparts, uh, friends and family on the right. And particularly with two examples, um, most recently with what we see right now going on on the federal level, um, as flawed as it may be, but if we look at this effort to try to overturn the electoral college, if you notice, you have senators and representatives both in states that went for Biden and those that went for Trump, and this is a coordinated effort. And then locally here in the state of Virginia, we had the Second Amendment, the two uh, sanctuary city movement. And while we may not agree with the logic, one thing to notice is that it was coordinated and it was unified. So here in the state of Virginia, the Second Amendment uh, sanctuary cities movement was basically um, a movement to thwart what conservatives see as uh, Democrats trying to take away their Second Amendment rights. Now, whether or not you agree with that, whether or not you feel like that's happening or not, the fact is they saw it as a threat and then they each in um, cities and counties across the Commonwealth went to their um, city councils and pushed them to adopt these measures. Now, I personally didn't, you know, don't agree with the uh, premise, but the point is they were able to get several counties throughout the state to adopt these measures and within a relatively short amount of time. And in my opinion, you know, I think we can really learn something from that because it was coordinated activism and grant there was money involved, but a lot of these people weren't rich, they're regular citizens like you and I. And I think in many ways, this goes back to the silos argument that Bakira was speak Bakira and Poli was speaking about before is that we're not coordinated in our efforts. And even within our coalition, Green New Deal coalition, a lot of times one hand doesn't know what the other one is doing. And as a result, we may be pushing for something for the ultimate bill that may end up being a poison pill for whatever the other groups may be working on. So I think A being coordinated, and then once we are coordinated, being able to move and lockstep. And again, I think that's something that those of us on the left of the spectrum are not always good at doing, and which is probably why we get um, outdone by those who tend on the right of the spectrum who tend not to um, agree with legislation like this, um, perceived aggressive legislation. So that's where, in my opinion, I see as a, a mechanism to where we can get unified and actually move in a coordinated front. I'll pass on the poll. Yeah, the threat is coordinated. So we better have the response being coordinated. Uh, I like to go, I, I particularly like history. So I like to go back to J.C. Staples of Kansas City, who you can see plotting out this coordinated uh, plan that reaches over the generations. He was a developer who wanted to make exclusive white residential areas he came up with racial, racially restricted covenants after there had been defeats from the federal level to, to their neo-Confederate side. And in the same uh, breath, he talked about well-manicured lawns and he said, why? It was to be able to keep people out of his neighborhood by adding essentially a tax and an arbitrary excuse to exclude people. He also was for balanced budgets. He was a hard money man, as they said. He was anti-MMT in the 1920s and 30s. And he was, guess what? For so-called right to work. There you have it all in one person. Then over in Kansas, across the river from him, uh, you have uh, Fred Koch, the father of the Koch brothers, setting up the uh, John Birch Society, letting you know very clearly the hard right perspective, being close friends with Reed Larson, who became the mastermind, not the founder, but the mastermind of the National Right to Work Committee, bringing it out to this very day. Larson died in only 2016 and was in Virginia. What's up with that? Well, what we have on our side, on their side, they have ownership, they have, they have money. And even if they don't have outright ownership, they have trust funds, they have family foundations. On our side, all we have is our puny votes. We are, we are weak, it's easy to put us down. You put pretextual pre policing, you put stop and frisk, and it is shown in uh, the research that that chills civic activity. 
because that civic activity is our power. All we have is solidarity. So we need to know the playbook well. That's where the MMT comes in. That's where understanding white supremacy comes in. We've got to know the playbook really well. And then we've got to play coordinated solidarity because that's the only power we have. Thank you guys all for that. I mean, my, my two cents on this is just to touch back on something that we talked about, I mean, even in the beginning of how Bakira described environmental justice and having the folks and all the other subject matters come out of that. Um, uh, Re uh, Representative Don McEachin said something recently that at a forum, the last night we were able to go to because of COVID, of course. Um, and it, it, that was extremely powerful to me, which was, yeah, we, we can have social justice, we can have racial justice, we can have, we can have um, economic justice, education justice, and none of those things would matter unless we addressed environmental justice. Because that's the essence of who we are, that's our essence of our being. It's how we live, how we eat, how we breathe, how we function, um, and, and that the reality of that set in so immediately to everyone in the room that you know what he's he's right if we if we don't address EJ if we don't address environmental justice then all those other things all automatically fall out of the window. Um, just that it, it, it's at its bare minimum, and I mean I I love that you use the um, the Margaret Thatcher quote at, at the beginning of the party because. While she did say that, she also reigned 11 years as prime minister over the harshest economic policy of any country in the world when she was prime minister. Um, it, it was, Thatcherism was considered as cruel government, cruel government, because she was taking away money from social programming. She was you know, making sure that people weren't taken care of. It actually caused a rift between her and the queen. Um, but it, they, they ended up calling it the era of cruelty. And so that, like, just having those things in, in mind um, when we when we talk about these things, especially a big big one for for you delegates are just to remember that yeah, I don't live in the sixth district, but I know that when I come into the House Appropriations Committee and we're talking about a bill that is addressing money that's going into every community or in in my community that's not in the sixth ninth district, I still gotta come to you. Your vote is the first one that goes across. Your eyes are the first ones that see it outside of legislation. Um, just, so just keeping that, keeping that in mind, I do want to open the floor for questions. We do have a, some time set aside for that. I didn't know if Jolene wanted to jump in here so we can see what the questions were. Yeah. Uh, I can totally bring up the questions. Can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Great. So the first question we have, um, it says, Pell Grants are now reinstated for incarcerated peoples, but Department of Corrections will need to dedicate resources to help people process applications, coordinate with colleges, provide space for students, and make internet available, etc. Can we push for this in the Green New Deal? Oh, I like. I, yeah, I think so. <laughs> Oh, so you mean just giving more resources to, to people so that they can properly educate themselves? Kind of crazy idea, right? Yes. Listen, um, our dear Harold Clark, um, <laughs> director of the Department of Correction, um, who has not pushed for adequate air conditioning in some of our facilities and basically had some of the worst conditions um, inside our, our prisons today, even with COVID. Um, I think we should push for that. I, I, I think that is when they took education away from, um, you know, our loved ones behind the bars, it was like, what, what did they, let me, let, let me say this, you guys, um, in case you all didn't know. Um, I am a formerly incarcerated Black woman case you all didn't know um and to go inside of a building and do nothing but 24 hours a day is the most ridiculous waste of money that we could have ever thought of in our entire lives 
if doing nothing is a punishment, and it, it and it actually it was a, it was a punishment for me because I wanted to do something. I needed to be doing something. But if we're going to spend now, mind you, going to going into our jails, you spend at least the the, the minimum is twenty seven thousand per year. Mind you, some of these people have never made twenty seven thousand per year ever. And so why are we investing in, in jail and, and prisons instead of investing in people? And that's, and we could probably save a boatload of money if we invested in people, right? And so sitting in a jail, not having access to any programs, any schooling, anything that would have aided in me not recidivating, which is a big thing that he hones in on, um, is recidivation. What are you expect? The question goes back to what are you expecting people to do if they're coming out in a worse condition than they were when they were going in? I, and I and I and that question is for the entire general assembly who thinks that prisons mm-hmm. solve these social problems that we have, especially economical problem, problems. To go and take thirty thousand dollars at bare minimum and put it into somebody sitting in a place doing nothing is absolutely fiscally irresponsible it really is and and it and it is and then you got to understand the the mental health impacts that come from incarceration please understand that some people go to prison and the body comes back but the mind never does. And so they're non-functioning, functioning in society. We have to talk about what prison does to people mentally. Depression, the worst kind of depression. And and I don't want us to, to fall into that. Well, if she did it, somebody else can do it. No, I suffered from depression for 20 years for a mistake that I made that took five minutes. And the opportunity that was extended to me to be right here today, I acknowledge is not there for all of my other loved ones that are either coming out or behind the bars or even out. This is a unique experience. And I had to fight for my place here. It wasn't, it most certainly wasn't given to me. I'm, I'm not, um, the most liked in the environmental justice world because I'm so intentional about people. You know, these children that the system is, is, is forcing to be in single parented home. State sanctioned single parentage. It's disgusting. And we don't even have time to get into the child welfare system because that's another system that is that we just need to just throw it up, just throw it in the trash, just throw the whole thing in the trash. And our government won't be responsible, won't take accountability for its actions, for its acts of domestic terrorism that it imposes on its own citizens. Those intentional words like domestic terrorism, none of them want to hear that. They're like, oh my God, we can't talk about that. But that's what's happening here. That's what the social justice and health disparities work group is talking about and wanting to fight against. But we can't do it without our legislators. We can't do it if people are not ready to have these hard conversations. Um, Should I get to the next question or does anyone else have anything to add? Um, no, I think it, I think we're just that. Okay, so the next one um, is is the team addressing for twenty twenty one the issue of emergency bans on evictions? Well, there are all kinds of things that make you vulnerable to evictions, and uh, the idea that that people live in these in these vulnerable uh, vulnerable spaces absolutely needs to be taken on. Uh, there are th- there are non there are reasons for other than non-payment of rent that are being used to make people housing insecure. 
those are binding even more now under the crisis. We should have removed those from J.C. Staples, uh, J.C. Nichols' time. Those should have long ago been. Those should have gone away with the formal end of segregation. They didn't. We need to take those out. So that is, uh, to to some extent, addressed. Uh, some of this has to happen at the federal level, but uh, we had for a time court-based uh, halt to evictions. But it's important for us to understand the powers of the different levels of government and to be able to advocate for those. So the municipal liquidity facility has changed recently. The treasury is no, now no longer in the way. Uh, our legislators should be prepared for and should be looking to borrow directly from the Federal Reserve and look for grants. I like the idea of the Pell Grant that was mentioned. That's federal funding that grows our state. Be sensitized to that, be aware of it, be aware that that's big and it's gonna be very big after what AOC did on New Year's. And that can be used to not put off, but end some of those financial sides of the eviction crisis. Um, on, the, on the federal level, I have been working with HUD on, um, it, and my thing was not just during COVID with housing, during whenever with housing, you know, we have a homelessness problem in this country. Um, and HUD has said that it has given authority, autonomy to local PHAs to basically accept and deny who they so choose, but they are encouraging local PHAs to start having a process that allows for people with criminal background records to receive um, public housing or section eight vouchers um, or for the, the state to open up, you know, a, a other state funded housing programs. Um, the problem is, is that the word autonomy, <laughs> given the state autonomy to do a certain thing um, that you are encouraging, if you know that it's right, just force the state to do it. Say, hey, if you don't do this, we're going to take away your federal funding. That's how we get it done, you know? Um, and so that is what uh, I have personally been working on, um, trying to get uh, Virginia uh, Department of Housing to uh, allow for a, a, a streamlined process across the state that says, yes, we're gonna take um, people that have um, background records and, and, and get them into you know um, public housing um, and, and Section 8 vouchers. And not only that, how we waste money with the Section 8 program is that we allow people to stay on Section 8 for eternity. Um, it should be a housing program that helps people to have home ownership. If you look at, say, for example, somebody's rent is $1,600, HUD is paying $1,600 a month. Over the course of 10 years, that homeowner has received $160,000 that could have went to the purchase of a home. We, there's homes on the market for way less. That could probably buy two homes. So now we could have purchased two homes for somebody to have so that they would not have to be homeless and they can have that in their in their um in their family and we can have you know uh um provisions on, on when they can sell it or, or what have you but those are the things that you know I, I I like to um have you know not crisis issued programs but I want sustainable programs whether there's a pandemic or not, I want people to have suitable housing, you know, period. So the next question, um, Pody, you may have um, addressed it in the chat, but in case you want to elaborate. Um, so should the federal jobs program include funding for training people in low income communities and the training should come now in order to prepare people for jobs that will be coming? Yes, so it's very important, the semantics, don't call it a jobs program, because the job guarantee is not a jobs program. It is a legal right that you can, that you can sue over to have a job, to be socially included into a going concern. And look back to the work of Martin Luther King, the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom and before to see the roots of that and the significance of that. So I'm unhappy when uh, even Sunrise Movement has fallen into that trap and VSA eco-socialists even as well of calling it, of saying some number of jobs. Now that converts it from a right that will be met for everybody to a commodity of which there's a scarce amount. So call it a job guarantee. That's very important. I capitalize it because there's a plan to go to the Levy Institute 
to look at uh, detailed plans. Then with regard to what you use that for, you use that to start with people, to improve and build up people. So as Bakura is saying, like trans transitioning to home ownership, uh, to uh, transition to ownership, uh, transitioning to being attractive for private sector and formal public sector employment. So that happens on the job. What about training? Please don't fall into the error that training produces jobs. That's how we got into the student loan crisis because people were told where well, if you just get credentialized, then you can get a job. Well, what people found was they got, they got the credential and structural racism was still there. Now you can't get the job and you have student debt. We need to cancel all student debt, by the way. <laughs> President uh, Biden can do that with an executive order. Education, then, what is it for? If it's not for getting a job, because that's what the job guarantee is for, uh, it is for social equality. And that goes way back on this soil right here in Virginia, right here in the Valley, in our, during our readjuster movement. That is how you learn to write and defend contracts so that you can have that property ownership. That is where you learn civic engagement that is being chilled, as we saw in other places. The Torah calls it terrorism. What is terrorism for? It's to chill, have a political effect. So I would agree with her on that. So definitely let's have education. And I like the idea of the Pell Grant. That's free college for all, free college for all, including all who are behind bars, uh, a system that we need to rethink and get rid of beyond the way to. And before we get there, absolutely open all human rights to all humans. They're voting, let people vote while they're behind bars. What sense does it make to not do it? It comes from faulty personal responsibility thinking that we have now seen is logically incoherent and rooted in white supremacy. And let them have uh, rights to be a human being aspiring to social equality. That would be education, a liberal arts education. That's what education is for. So workforce development, but general social equality development. We should absolutely have that be a part of uh, what happens along with the job guarantee. Does anyone else have anything to add? Otherwise, I will ask the last question from the audience. Okay. So the last question that we have tonight is, what about Citizens United and corporations being considered people who can spend as much as they want to lobby and corrupt the government? Can we succeed against that? Miss Betty, I saw that question. And let me tell you, it makes me want to vomit to have businesses as people. Because what one thing we know is that those businesses ain't going to jail. And that's one thing that, that, that uh, differentiates us from a business and and how did how we got um how did we get to that place i don't know but that's a bunch of shenanigans um if if businesses are people then they should be held accountable in the same way and whoever is the president ceo director whatever they need to go to jail <laughs> and that's that's you know when we're talking about accountability they need to go to jail when when i got into environmental justice work um, and and as, as Charles mentioned, because uh, I was a, a fellow with the Virginia Civic Engagement Table, and I was kicking and screaming. I did not want to go. I didn't know anything about it. I was like, oh, no, I got to stick to criminal justice work. So many people need me. I, I can't go. And I and I tried to, to bomb the interview, and then they called me back again. And I was like, what in the world did I do right? I just I didn't think I answered any of those questions correctly. And I went for the second interview because you had to. And I ended up getting a job as a, as a state lead for um, with Virginia Conservation Network um, doing climate and sea level rise. And um, because I don't like doing um, things I don't know, I went and I dug into environmental work and I just was blown away at what we allowed. I, I said, all of this is criminal. What in the world? Like. <laughs> And so then I started to make the connections and that's, and then, and then when I went back to my boss, Christy, I love her. She said, that's why we hired you because we needed you to make the connection and who better than you. And I was like, oh, well, why you didn't tell me that in the first place then? <laughs> 
And so making those connections, Miss Betty, is, is extremely important and, and continuing to call that thing out. You know, um, um, my mentor uh, uh, is, is on the line, um, Queen Shabbat. Listen, let me tell you, um, she has walked me through and I, I am so honored to be, um, you know, walking beside her in, 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 this, in this fight. I'm learning about Cancer Valley and, you know, all of the other egregious, just despicable, horrible acts that state governments have allowed corporations to do to people. And those folks go home at night and sleep very well on that 1200 count thread sheet, King, California King beds with their, uh, um, Perrier waters, when people are dying, people are dying. And we have people in prison for a lesser infraction than that. You know, some folks are in there because they're habitual speeders. You know, you can go to prison for <laughs> habitually speeding. You know, driving without a license too many times will get you a prison sentence. When we have corporation CEOs and presidents who have killed thousands and are at home making millions. The only people who can put a stop to it is us. Collectively, statewide power. We have to know each other across the state. We got to. It's paramount that we build people, political power. That's the only thing that's going to save us. And I'll add on to that real quick. Um, in lieu of that, you know, the last line of defense then becomes civil disobedience. So um, I didn't mention, but I also work with a group called um, Greenpeace a few years back. And part of my job was working against pipelines and you and Bakira mentioned um, Cancer Valley, and in places like Louisiana, which is where I did some work, um, you literally have corporations. Well, first of all, like Louisiana and Texas are pretty much run by the oil industry, but they would literally violate ordinances and agreements that they would have, like not to um, build in a certain section or not to go past a certain amount of miles or on the certain lands or whatnot. And they just openly uh, violate them. And in many cases, the courts wouldn't say anything. Like you literally have community members going to the court saying, look, they're violating this. And the uh, companies will go and say, well, it's within our right. Or they would just violate it knowing that they had enough money to pay the fine. So just like Bakira said, in many cases, they're not treated the same way as we are. And part of that is because money talks. And we see that, you know, rich people, they know they can get away with what they want to do because there's an old saying I'm pretty sure some of you've heard is it's better to be um, guilty as hell and rich as hell than to be uh, innocent and poor. And we see that playing itself out in the environmental struggle where they know that they can pollute because most of the communities they're polluting, the people aren't really in a position to fight back financially. And the example I'm talking about you know, folks literally went and locked themselves to the equipment. They went out in the swamp and literally shut down construction for days on end. And that's ultimately how the project uh, failed to come to fruition. And even here in Virginia, it's not talked about much, but we had a whole tree citizens movement out in the uh, western part of the state and in uh, West Virginia. They was um, to stop or delay construction on the MVP. And that's part of what helped stop the uh, MVP is countless people uh, engaging in acts of civil disobedience. So that's not the, um, for those of us who have an apprehension to being arrested or who have already encountered the law, that's not the most ideal scenario, but um, there are folks doing that. So that is one way to counteract these corporations, just run them up is to let them know, you know, we're willing to put our bodies on the line if and when need be. So um, I just wanted to add that because I think it's an important component that isn't often 
talk about because it is the last resort um, before all our chaos is letting know that we're not going to stand for it. Right. And I want to add one more piece. Um, we talked about our legislators, but there's another component that we have to um, monitor, and that's our administrative agencies. Um, I don't know how many times we have <laughs> um, thrown stakes at the Department of Environmental Quality <laughs> um, for, uh, you know, permits that we, you know, just were, were, were bad, bad permits that they had granted. And so, you know, not only following our legislators, we got we to gotta make sure that our department heads, our administrative agency department heads are in line as well. And so when there's job openings, um, you know, for these positions, um, we need to have people that are ready and qualified to take these jobs. And also, you know, there's mechanisms available to us. And when we don't like who is sitting in any of these state offices, we have the right to complain. We have the right to um, before the committees and say, listen, we want this person out. He's, he's bad for Virginia, you know, and whether they do it or not, is on the record and and eventually um that job position will become available and we need to make sure we have the right candidates um that can take those jobs and push for those people um to get those to get those jobs when they you know become available so having that people power and and being able to influence uh um our uh um legislators and our governor who who does these appointments and hiring uh, because one thing we do know is that the governor has to get the entire state to to vote for him so if we got people power he's not putting in these offices say he knows that <laughs> that term is going to be a little a lot less limited than the two terms he gets it's not, it's not going to be uh or the one term he gets it's, it's not going to be another come around um you know, and 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 we have to make sure that we are um, we're we're pushing for that. If I can, if I can bookend it, uh, Betty just asks brilliant questions. If you want to be in the company of her asking such questions, stop by Virginia Progressives, and uh, be uh, be the wind under the under the the wings that we've seen here tonight. It's such. A tremendous honor and what uh what her question brings out is kind of bookending this thing that i started with how to pay for it and how changing how we see that changes our our minds the way we pay for things in the united states there's not a sovereign who issues currency the, the constitution delegates that to congress specifically to the house of representatives for origination of bills and what is the house of representatives well a representative is a person that we send forward with our little hands, we human beings with a vote. And that representative sits with other representatives in the house and they vote on what we want to do. And whatever the number is that says how much that will cost, they communicate that to the treasury if the bill passes, who communicates it to the Federal Reserve and they just credit the appropriate accounts. That's all there is to it for the federal level. But notice what that shows. It shows that we, with our little hands, under our Constitution, have the power to move a pen that writes a number arbitrarily big to shape society with our hands. What do Citizens United want to do? Well, if Margaret Thatcher gets us to put our hand down, all that's left to shape society is the people with the biggest stashes of permissions. And if we let the corporations do this, that further erodes our relative power because it weakens our vote. So that brings it full circle and that puts people again at the center. And that's why this group is so important. And it's been such an honor for me to have, uh, have a small part in this. I would like to second that. It has been an absolute honor and pleasure working with everyone in this work group. And thank you guys for taking the time to, to sit with us today. Um, I do want to allow um, a few minutes to see if there's any questions from the audience. Um, and then I'll bring this to a close. And Jolene, did we have any more questions from the audience? Um, none that I see. Okay. Um, 
So uh, again, thank you guys for, for taking the time. Uh, we do meet every, I believe it's every other Tuesday, if I'm not mistaken, right? Every Tuesday or every other Tuesday for um, the work group. Um, we meet at around, if I'm not mistaken, 7, 37 p.m. Um, and we do have a world of conversations. There's not really a conversation that we've ever taken off the table, um, even if it was just to gather more. So I, I would like to welcome anyone in the room who would like to take that time to just uh, reach out to any of us in, uh, here in the working group and see our names in the chat or um, reach out to one of the uh, leadership folks in the community of reading here, which would be Lee Williams or Karen. Um, and they'll uh, shoot you our way. Um, Again, thank you guys. Thank you to our panelists. Um, thank you again, Delegate Carp, for being here. Thank you for all of the amazing Virginians or non Virginians for that matter that decided to join us this evening. I hope you all have a very pleasurable rest of your evening and happy holidays and happy holidays to you all. Happy holidays, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invite, Bakira.